Hi, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I am Amy Hajari Case. I'm a senior medical advisor at the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, and I am so excited to welcome you to a very special edition of our disease education education webinar series, ILD Day. Um, we are just uh, thrilled today uh, to have a panel talking about um, an issue that is so significant and important to so many of our patients um, during the month of September, which is um, Pulmonary Fibrosis Awareness Month. Um, and we've come together to talk about this really important topic of oxygen. Um, I'm gonna start out by thanking our partners. I will not read them all off, but you can see this has been just a wonderful partnership between all of these different organizations uh, to put this webinar together and reach um, all of our different communities together today. So thank you to um, all of these different organizations and the folks that have worked with us on ILD Day. Um, I am joined today by some wonderful presenters. Before I introduce them to you, I'm just gonna go over a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, if you will go to your control panel, which uh, should be on the right side of your screen, to the bottom of that, you can see a list of, of um, drop-down menus. One will say handouts. If you drop down the handout menu, you can download these slides in PDF format if you want to look at them later or print them out, something like that. You can go uh, there and, um, and find those. If you will go one level below, that is the chat menu. If you'll drop down the chat menu, you can send a message to our team here behind the scenes for any technical issues or, um, or other concerns about the webinar itself. And then if you have any questions that you would like to ask of our esteemed panel today, we will take questions at the end, but if something comes to you during the webinar, we'd love to have you go ahead and submit it in the question menu, which is um, just above handouts and polls. Um, there, you may not have the polls, uh, but it's also on your control panel. So if you drop that down, you can type your questions in and we will try to reach as many of those as we can at the end of our session today. Um, so without, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our presenters. First is Dr. Jisha Joshua. She's an associate professor of medicine and the director of the Advanced Lung Disease Program at the University of California in San Diego, which is one of our uh, PFF Care Center network sites. She earned her medical degree from Christian Medical College in India, after which she moved to San Diego and completed her residency in internal medicine, her fellowship in pulmonary medicine, both at UC San Diego School of Medicine. She specializes in treating patients with interstitial lung disease and she has a particular interest in connective tissue disease-related ILD. Her research interests include gastroesophageal reflux and pulmonary hypertension that's related to ILD. Next up, we will have Susan Jacobs. Uh, she's a research nurse, nurse manager in the Stanford University Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine, as well as a nurse coordinator in their ILD program. Susan's clinical background includes critical care nurse educator, pulmonary rehab program coordinator, and project director for a dyspnea, or shortness of breath, NIH research study. Susan was the lead author on the first national patient survey of almost 2,000 supplemental oxygen users in the U.S., and also for the ATS, or American Thoracic Society, clinical practice guideline publication on home oxygen therapy for adults with chronic lung disease. She is the, uh, as the chair for the American Thoracic Society's Oxygen Special Interest Group, Susan collaborates with policymakers and advocacy groups to address care gaps for patients who are using supplemental oxygen. And she serves on the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation's Board of Directors, the Medical Advisory Board, and she served as the Stanford ILD Support Group Coordinator since 2004. And I'm just going to ad lib here, Susan. Susan knows more about oxygen than anybody in the world that I know. So she's an incredible resource for us to have here today. Um, finally, we'll hear from Gary Ewart. Uh, 
Uh, he's the Chief of Advocacy and Government Relations at the American Thoracic Society. The ATS is a diverse organization. There's a multitude of advocacy work that the society is currently engaged in. And at this time, Gary's leading the ATS's advocacy efforts, including shaping coverage and reimbursement policies for Medicare. He frequently meets with private health insurance companies to ensure their, their coverage policies include the latest technologies in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. And the ATS will also be working with members of Congress to introduce legislation to reform how Medicare reimburses for supplemental oxygen. So I'm really excited to hear um, from Gary on those topics as well. So um, we are going to get started with Dr. Joshua. Before we do, I will just remind everybody that um, our information given out today is for educational and informational purposes only. And uh, if you have any questions ar around your specific medical condition, please consult your personal physician or healthcare provider. All right, Dr. Joshua. Thank you so much for being here. I'll hand it off to you now. Thank you, Dr. Case. So uh, today, uh, my job is to, um, you know, go over some of the more anatomy and physiology aspects of oxygen, and to let you know about the importance of oxygen, as well as how pulmonary fibrosis can affect oxygenation, and what might be some of the symptoms of having low oxygen. So, if you can uh, move forward, the next slide. So we'll start with um, how oxygen gets into our body and reaches where it's supposed to be. Before that, as you all know, oxygen is most essential um, element uh, for, for our survival. And the reason being that oxygen is essential for generation of energy for each and every cell of our body. And cells form our organs, organs form our organ systems, and organ systems are make, what makes it function. So uh, each and every function of our human body is basically uh, dependent on oxygen. So oxygen comes from the atmosphere and our body, uh, you know, the most important organs being the lungs, uh, take that oxygen. And our lungs are made up of very little, you know, small air sacs, like a lot, lot of them that connect directly or touch directly with the blood uh, that flows through our blood vessels. And the oxygen in those air sacs, it diffuses very easily into those blood vessels. The reason being that, as you can see here on your left, left side, the little air sacs have very thin lining and the blood vessels are very thin lining around them. And that very thin and permeable and elastic lining is what helps your oxygen to diffuse from the air sac into the blood vessel very easily, as well as it lets the carbon dioxide that the tissues generate after using up the oxygen to let diffuse from the blood vessel into the air sac and come out of your lungs. So the lungs are the most important organs to accept that oxygen and push it into the blood vessels. Following that, the heart uh, pumps that blood into the rest of the body. And uh, from there, each and every organ system and organ and tissue receives that oxygen, uses it inside its cells and uh, produces carbon dioxide, which is taken back to the heart and then to the lungs. So our body is like, uh, you know, all these organ systems work together in such beautiful coordination and adaptation that it ensures that every cell of the body, especially the most important ones like the brain and the heart, receive oxygen at all times. If there is any, you know, perturbation in that uh, process, uh, each organ tries to adapt to that. So for example, if you get low oxygen because there is not enough oxygen in the air, your heart uh, starts pumping more. So you might notice an increase in your heart rate. Um, and some of the other organs that may not need that much oxygen try to like do less activity so that there is more oxygen to the more vital organs. So the body is constantly adapting and helping each other, each organ system to uh, get, get that necessary oxygen. Um, it's a next slide, please. So let's see uh, why that oxygen is so important, what goes on inside the cell. There's a little bit more in, in, in detail, but basically uh, the food that we eat is what you know uh, gives us energy. But for that food to give us energy, it has to go through these multiple steps of digestion and metabolism. And one of the last steps that happens inside the cell is that the food or the glucose, it, it's digested into these very small molecules called NADH and FADH2. And these H in there are hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions, they can make free protons um, 
to be able to make those free protons, it has to give away its electrons. So um, the free protons are what are needed for uh, a, a pathway in the cell called ATP synthesis or production of ATP to happen. And ATP is the energy molecule of the cell that, that really drives all the functions of the cell. So ATP is formed by another molecule called ADP. And for ADP to be become ATP, you need those protons, those free protons. And for NADH and FADH2 to make those free protons, it needs to give away its electrons. And somebody needs to accept those electrons for those protons to become free. And who does that is your oxygen. So oxygen accepts those electrons, lets the protons at the H plus become free. The H plus goes to ADP and converts it into ATP. And ATP is what generates energy or is the energy um, that powers all the functions of the cells and organs in your body. So um, lack of oxygen will basically shut out that pathway and your cell uh, would start depending on other pathways to generate energy, which are not that effective. So next slide, please. Um, so moving on to why pulmonary fibrosis then might affect oxygenation. So if you remember from the first slide that your lungs are made up of these alveolar spaces or air sacs that we call it uh, to receive oxygen from the atmosphere. And they are lined by very thin um, lining or cell lining. And as you can see here in the bottom on the normal lung, um, so th this is like if you uh, slice the lung tissue and put it under the slide on pathology, you see on the lower bottom where you see a pink um, pink square, uh, it has the normal lung tissue. And you can see these very small squiggly lines. So those are the lining of the air sacs. And you can see they're so thin. And right next to them are the, the little more like pink globs that you can see. Those are your blood vessels. So they're right next to the blood vessel. And the blood vessel lining is very thin. And that lets the oxygen pass through uh, by a process called diffusion. So it happens on its own. But what happens in pulmonary fibrosis? Pulmonary fibrosis, as you know, is a process where there is inflammation and scarring inside uh, the lung. And where that scarring occurs is actually in that lining of the lung that we are talking about. So between your alveolar space or your air sac and your blood vessel, it, that 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 lining of the lung is called interstitium, and that's where uh, all this uh, these inflammation cells they deposit, and over time they cause uh, deposition of some material that looks like scar, and that makes that lining get thicker and thicker. So instead of being that very thin, elastic, permeable membrane, it becomes a very thick membrane that doesn't let things pass through easily. Not just that, in fibrosis, over time, as you get more and more thickening of these airways or uh, these the lining, the alveoli or the air sacs actually start uh, collapsing. So there might be loss of alveolar spaces. And along with that, there would be loss of the blood vessels that go, go with it. So the lack of enough air sacs and blood vessels reduces the surface area through which that oxygen can pass through. So it's not just thickening of that lining, it's also loss of that lining. You know, so both these processes make oxygen much harder from uh, the atmosphere to get into your blood vessels. So there will be still some normal tissue, right? Um, in the areas of the normal tissue, the oxygen, there are some certain mechanisms that get activated. So more oxygen can get in uh, into the air sacs, into the blood. But as the process gets worse and worse, you may exhaust that compensation, right? And ultimately we start seeing that not enough oxygen reaches the blood. So when not enough oxygen reaches the blood, that's when we call it uh, a low oxygen state. It's also called hypoxia. So hypoxia means a low oxygen state in the blood. Um, and as the cells that are you know, downstream that blood vessel see less and less oxygen, that process of having low oxygen inside the cell um, is also called tissue hypoxia, tissue hypoxia. So that's how the pulmonary fibrosis or any disease that affects that lining of the lung uh, affects the oxygen flow uh, from getting into the lung. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just quickly discuss some terminologies because it gets confusing as to how do we measure this oxygen then, like if it's in the blood or is it in the tissue, and what does it mean to be really hypoxic or having hypoxia? So the most easiest, uh, the easiest way to measure your oxygen is your oxygen saturation through a pulse oximeter that you all wear uh, to check your oxygen. So what that does is it's measuring the amount of oxygen uh, that is saturating the hemoglobin in the blood. 
okay so it's measuring your basically the amount of oxygen in your blood and it's uh, you know, it can vary a little bit depending on your skin color. Um, it also can vary, you know, based on the circulation. Sometimes if your hands are too cold, it may not give a good reading because you're not getting that enough blood supply to show how much your oxygen is. So sometimes you might want to measure it on your ear or uh, in your rehab, they might measure it on, on your forehead. So that that is called uh, SpO2 or just an oxygen saturation. And the normal range is around 94 to 100%. When it goes below 90% is when we call it hypoxia. There is another uh, terminology called arterial oxygen saturation, which is very similar to your regular oxygen saturation that you get through your pulse oximeter, but this one is measured by doing a arterial um, blood sample. So uh, you might have gotten this done um, in the lab where they stick a needle in, in your wrist uh, to get a sample from directly from your artery to really measure how much oxygen is carried by the hemoglobin molecules. And the range for this is the same. Uh, it's also called SAO2 instead of SPO2. And anything less than 90% is considered uh, abnormal. Another term we get, uh, we see often is called the partial pressure of oxygen or PAO2. And what that means is how much oxygen is dissolved in the blood and how much pressure is it generating in the blood. So the oxygen has to have a particular higher pressure to be able to get into the cells and do its job. So this can only also be measured only by doing a blood sample from your artery, right? So uh, you cannot measure this by using a pulse oximeter. And the, the normal number for that is anywhere between 75 to 100%. So it's not the same as your 90% with your pulse oximeter. And anything less than 60% is considered to be hypoxia. Sometimes your oxygen companies and the insurance companies ask you to uh, have that particular guideline be met to be able to get you home oxygen is you have to show on an arterial stick that your um, partial pressure of oxygen or a PAO2 is less than 60%. Uh, and finally, uh, a very common term used is called the diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide or DLCO. This is a term that we see when you go to a lung function lab or a pulmonary function lab and get your PFT done. Um, it's one of the tests where they tell you about your oxygen exchange capacity. But instead of using oxygen to measure that, they use small amounts of carbon monoxide, which easily diffuses into your blood vessel from the air sac. And it tells you, it kind of gives you a surrogate as to how good is that membrane doing its function of letting oxygen or any of the gas go through into the blood. So this uh, we use on a you know, regular basis if you have pulmonary fibrosis to monitor the pulmonary fibrosis to tell you if it's getting worse or if there is fluid or some other reason why that membrane is not doing its work, its job. So this, uh, or also called DLCO, it's basically measured only through the lung function test. And the normal number is only decided by if you have a reference population and you know what the normal would be for that population. So there's no particular cutoff to say less than this is you know, low. Usually around less than 70% is when we think it's low, but it's, it really depends on what your, the normal population that you are comparing to. What is their normal and is yours less than that? So um, it's, it's very different from a pulse oximeter number that you get on your read on your finger. So that's just for the terminology, just to clarify that. Now let's move on to the next slide um, and talk about what can happen if you don't get enough oxygen. So as we, we discussed, oxygen is required for every cell in your body to function. There are some organs that depend a little bit more on oxygen than the others, for example, your brain. So if you are having very low oxygen, for example, like in, in your high, low 80s or less than 80%, you may start getting cognitive impairment, uh, that is memory issues and you know uh, inattention, um, confusion, things like that. So shortness of breath is not really the first symptom that you would get when you have low oxygen. It's more of these uh, cognitive uh, function that you might uh, start experiencing. And over time, if you have low, low oxygen for a very long time, then those mechanisms of compensations that your heart and your other organs have been working hard to compensate, they start failing and you could get your heart, you know, can get affected. And so uh, what happens is your heart uh, will start, you know, having to beat much faster and much stronger for a very long time. That really makes it tired and uh, it may not allow the blood to kind of flow in the, in the normal direction. And we'll discuss that uh, in the next slide. But ultimately, you can get something called heart failure.
um, your lungs are trying to compensate for the lack of oxygen. So you may experience, you know, having to take quicker breaths, quicker, shallow breaths, and that can lead you to have that sensation of breathlessness because you are working hard to breathe, right? Um, you may, um, your kidneys can, you know, sense that and they start producing this, uh, this molecule or hormone called erythropoietin, uh, which is uh, meant to increase the production of blood cells from your bone marrow to be able to get more oxygen. And that can increase the thickness or the viscosity of the blood because there are more cells in the blood now, and that can make you prone to getting blood clots. Okay. And um, the other problem uh, with low oxygen is your lungs trying to compensate for the lack of oxygen. The blood vessels in the lungs can constrict, uh, trying to push, push more oxygen to the good areas in the lung. And that can lead to a complication called pulmonary hypertension. And we'll discuss that uh, in more detail soon. Um, in your muscles, your uh, oxygen, you know, is what pr provides the muscles the energy to move. And so uh, as your oxygen is low, the muscles kind of start using other ways to get energy. And that produces what we call more lactate. And lactate is the reason why you feel tired or fatigued in the muscle. So that can lead to reduced exercise capacity. And overall, uh, because of low oxygen, your, your body in general also activates a lot of stress pathways um, and uh, genes are, a lot of genes are expressed uh, that lead to uh, overall kind of increase in inflammation in your lung, so uh, in your body. So those are like the uh, common consequences of chronic hypoxia. Next slide, please. Um, but just remember like shortness of breath, we always think low oxygen, shortness of breath. It doesn't necessarily mean shortness of breath. You might see people who have low oxygen, but they don't even feel it. Well, there will be others who, who don't have a low oxygen, but they're very short of breath. So it doesn't correlate directly because shortness of breath is a function of, you know, how much work you are doing to just breathe, right? So it could be just from the fact that your lungs are very uh, stiff from the fibrosis, so you're having a very hard time opening them up. It could be from cardiac dysfunction, so you may have extra fluid on board. That's probably leading to the shortness of breath. Uh, the need for having to breathe faster and harder can also lead to shortness of breath. Also, uh, you know, if you don't you do much because of the lack of oxygen or the shortness of breath, uh, you could have lack of muscle that can lead to more shortness of breath as well. So um, there have been studies looking at if you give patients how oxygen, does it improve their, you know, quality of life or performance. And it did, actually. It did improve your walk performance and reduce dyspnea in patients with fibrosis. But whether it was directly related to oxygen therapy alone or whether there was a placebo effect, it, it's a subject to debate. But, um, but it did, did improve quality of life. Next slide, please. Finally, um, we would like to I would like to talk about pulmonary hypertension, which is a common term uh, your doctors might be using. Um, we regularly screen you with an echocardiogram to look for this complication, and really, this is a complication of having very low oxygen over a long time in patients with lung fibrosis. So, uh, what happens, as I said, is as your lungs are starving for oxygen, they contract or their blood vessels uh, constrict so that the the good the blood uh, can go to good areas in the lung that can get more oxygen so the areas that have fibrosis the blood vessels contract so that the blood is pushed away from them but over time when that contraction keeps on happening it can lead to that blood vessel shrinking and causing more scarring around that blood vessel and becoming a permanent problem like the blood doesn't go into those blood vessels so constriction as well as we call it remodeling of those blood vessels can make your blood pressure inside those blood vessels go up. So if you can imagine a hose pipe where blood is or water is flowing, you tighten that hose or you make that uh, make the hose wall very stiff, the pressure inside that of that water inside will go up. So your blood pressure goes up inside the blood vessels in the in the lungs. This is very different from blood pressure of the rest of the body. So this doesn't correlate with your blood pressure that you get when you measure your pressure on the arm. This is just specific to the lung. So the blood pressure in the lung goes up and because your heart is trying to push blood into the lung to get it oxygenated, the heart ha sees that pressure and thinks, hmm, this is like really high pressure. I'm not able to push against this, this much of high pressure. So the blood, uh, the heart has a harder time pushing blood into the lung because of this high pressure in the lung. 
what happens over time when the heart like has to do that all the time, it ultimately fails and it's not able to push all its blood into the lung to get it oxygenated. Some of the blood stays behind or even leaks out into the rest of the body. And you could see uh, signs of heart failure like swelling in your legs or actually having more um, fluid build up in your lungs that causes even more um, oxygen problems. So it's a vicious cycle where your lungs get low oxygen, they increase the blood pressure, makes the heart have a hard time pushing blood into it, and then ultimately uh, causes more fluid to build up in the lungs that causes more oxygen problems. So we want to prevent this complication and the most important way of preventing it is by ensuring that you get good enough oxygen and your lungs are not having to go through that process, right? The second most important thing to treat this is to try to control the fibrosis itself because it is the fibrosis that's the cause of having low oxygen and destruction of your blood vessels. So whatever the treatment of the fibrosis is, is also important. And ultimately there is a new um, therapy called inhaled triprostanol that was recently approved for for treatment of pulmonary hypertension and was shown to improve your exercise capacity if you were on this medication. So those those would be um, those are the things that I wanted to share with you. I would hand this over to, to Susan Jacobs, who um, is going to talk to you about oxygen devices and oxygen delivery, and and show you how to actually get you this oxygen if you need it. Thank you. Go ahead, Susan. Okay, welcome. So thank you for that great overview. It leads us right into uh, really a, a, the whole practical um, issues of actually using supplemental oxygen. So I will go through uh, the different types of oxygen delivery systems, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the technical information, which is really uh, can be confusing to both patients and clinicians about the different types of flow, pulse versus continuous, and then really try and address how we can uh, keep our patients mobile and out of the house and those who need um, high flow oxygen. So going on to the next slide, this is really a kind of a summary slide that shows us the three different types of uh, oxygen that we can provide patients outside the home and, and in the home as well. And the first is compressed gas, which you can see there the first um, picture of all the different sized tall tanks with the green tops. Those are um, canisters. That's gas that's just compressed, placed in the canister. And you can see some are more portable than others. Uh, the other ones we're going to talk about are concentrators. And these are the devices kind of in the middle picture there, the three different, four different um, types of, of, of devices that actually can concentrate the ambient air and, and actually produce a concentrated form of oxygen and they just extract it from the ambient air. And these come both portable and stationary. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about liquid, uh, which is hard to get a hold of now, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So you can see um, there are kind of a variety of ways we can provide oxygen. So going on to the next slide. With compressed gas, I think most of you are most familiar, especially if you're in the hospital setting, you see E-tanks. And these are the tall tanks that um, you know are need a trolley. They're not portable. They can't go in a backpack or on a shoulder. And these, on a setting of uh, four to six liters a minute, might last an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Now, if you put a pulse regulator, and we'll talk about what that means, the the life of these e tanks can be extended to five to eight hours. So that's one of the advantages of, of pulse flow. In the middle, you can see kind of the middle sized tank. These are B tanks, can be a C tank as well. This is an M M6. These can be in a backpack and a shoulder pack. So these are compressed gas that actually are, are, are much more portable. Um, and, and then some of them do have regulators that can switch between um, providing a pulse dose or continuous flow. And then lastly, we have the compressed gas units that are um, at home. And these use what we call a home fill unit, and it uses a stationary concentrator, and it has this um, apparatus that you stick on top of it, and you can actually place these metal compressed gas canisters on it and fill your own tanks at home. And these uh, 
we'll talk about as well. They they take smaller tanks, C and D tanks. They're pretty slow to fill, but it is a system that allows you to fill your own tanks at home and not have to you know, depend on deliveries every week, depending on how many tanks that you need. So going on to the next slide, we can see the pros and cons of compressed gas oxygen. So the advantage, the pros, are that the E-tanks, which are large, um, have the capability of providing high flow. And by that, we really mean patients who need over three to four liters continuous flow per minute. Really, the E-tank is probably the only uh, you know, type of oxygen that's readily available right now that can provide very high flow. It doesn't last very long, but it can provide high flow. And then as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can see that these compressed gas tanks, some of the sizes can be filled at home. Now the disadvantages uh, are pretty obvious, especially to those who use these, uh, the size and the weight. I mean, these are you know 15 to 18 pounds with the trolley. And you can imagine the challenge of a patient who lives um, up multiple stairs, has to lift this in and out of a car. Um, it can be very difficult. So they're burdensome. The DMEs, the durable medical equipment companies, may limit the number of tanks they can provide you each week. So if you depend on these tanks to be out of the house, uh, you may find yourself having to kind of ration your, your tanks and depend on, you know, careful planning on where you, how many hours a week you're going to be out of the house because of your DMA may be limited in how many tanks they can deliver to you each week. Um, and then the slow fill, I've mentioned already, some of these tanks can be filled at home, but they're, it's quite slow to fill them and it may not meet your needs of um, giving you enough tanks to get out of the house. So going on to the concentrators in our next slide, I'm sorry, liquid. So liquid oxygen actually got a lot of attention during COVID, especially around the world. When you saw these uh, pictures of these, these trucks, these are specialized trucks that have to deliver liquid oxygen. Hospitals use liquid oxygen to provide um, what comes out of the wall in the, in the patient rooms. So liquid oxygen is basically a form of oxygen that is super cooled down and it in turns to, it's liquid and it turns into a gas when it comes out into room air. The advantage is you can basically fit a larger quantity of oxygen in a smaller canister to take out of the house. So it basically is a form of oxygen that's quite compressed, but that can last longer and therefore you have um, the, the option for portability with a longer lasting um, device and it can provide liquid um, and continuous flow. Um, some of these deliver, you know, up to 15 liters. Obviously, you'd need more than one, and some come in uh, canisters that are qu quite large, but and might need a trolley. They do use a home fill system, as you can see here. We refer to it as the mother tank, and that is the tank that a driver comes out every week to deliver and fill. Not deliver, but they refill it every week, and then you can fill your own portable tank when you leave the house. So the main issue with liquid oxygen is the higher cost because the, the, the equipment company has to deliver and refill every week, which means a driver coming every week. There do tend to be a few more technical issues um, and, they, and the companies do need these special trucks. So the pros and cons on the next slide uh, of liquid is really the advantage is it provides high flow, continuous high flow in a portable canister and that these canisters actually last longer than compared to um, a compressed gas at the same flow rate. The disadvantages, these canisters can evaporate over time. So if you fill them, you do need to use them. You need to stay upright. There's a little bit of dexterity involved and there's some risk of getting these kind of freezer burn type thing with the liquid nitrogen as it fills the portable canister. And of course, the biggest disadvantage is that we don't find this form of oxygen available anywhere. Uh, rare. I won't say anywhere, but it's extremely rare. Where I am in California, we don't find it. Um, and this has been a big uh, issue that we've taken on because we do feel this is a, a real necessity for those patients who need high flow and are, who are mobile and getting out of the house. Uh, so this is the biggest disadvantage. It's simply not available and it's mainly a cost issue. So in the next slide, we can talk a little bit about the uh, stationary concentrators. So these concentrators work by basically extracting the oxygen from the air around you. It runs through a sieve bed that's, that 
pulls out nitrogen and basically spits out a more concentrated form of oxygen. So you never really can run out of oxygen, but these do run by battery. So the battery life is, of course, somewhat limited. You can replace batteries and you can plug them in. So this will spit out you know, anywhere from 85 to 95 percent oxygen. And they come both in a stationary and in a portable form. Next. Next slide, thanks. So you can see there's a lot of choices for portable uh, oxygen concentrators. These are, if you have a huge range in weight, some are very tiny, three pounds, and can be like a purse, um, easily backpack over the shoulder, all the way up to 18 pounds. Those are the rare ones that might provide up to three liters of continuous flow. So the battery life, uh, as I mentioned, can concentrate the ambient air. The time to charge each battery varies. Um, continuous flow uses more battery, higher pulse flow settings use more battery, and higher breathing rates use more battery. They can run on DC power, you can plug them in in your car. This is the only form of portable oxygen that can go on an airplane, it's FAA approved. You do need to have one and a half times the hours of the flight in your battery um, capacity that you have to take on board with you. You do need testing on these devices before you purchase or use them to make sure that they meet your oxygen demands and that they will continue to do so. We also know that none of these devices provide continuous flow over three liters per minute, and those are rare. So the majority of these provide one to two liters of flow and are on a pulse dose um, system. And if you do purchase or rent these, um, it's very important to find out what your backup um, service agreement is. Will they replace it? How fast can they get you a replacement? Is there a warranty? And that sort of thing. And that's really important when you're especially purchasing yourself. And they're, they're very expensive, uh, you know, anywhere from two to $3,000. So next one. So the pros and cons. These POCs, as we call them, are very lightweight. Many of them, most of them are very lightweight. And you can use them for air travel and you can plug them into your car and you can purchase or rent extra batteries to extend their time. And you can use them in a backpack. Now, of course, the visual here is that the disadvantages are, are um, mainly important for you to understand. Uh, the lighter the POC, in general, the lower the oxygen delivery capacity. And the majority of POCs use this pulse dose number. It's a number setting on your machine. It's not liters per minute. And this is confusing, not just to patients, but also very confusing also to clinicians, nurses, physicians, et cetera. So it's important to understand that most POCs, even when you have it on a setting number as high as six, are actually only delivering a total of about one to two liters per minute. Uh, these devices deliver so many milliliters of oxygen in each of their little pulses um, that you receive when you're breathing. For many of our patients with uh, pulmonary fibrosis, when you're breathing at a more rapid, shallow, higher um, rate, they may not trigger the device. The device only triggers and delivers oxygen when you breathe in. That's the pulse setting. The other confusing point is in our clinics, when we test our patients, we test patients on an e-tank or continuous flow. And we write the prescription. The patient may need four liters per minute during exertion. And then if they are delivered a POC, that assumption is that's a setting of four. And in fact, those don't always equal each other. So that's something that's very uh, important to be clear about. So again, uh, they're expensive to purchase also if your DME doesn't provide them. And we have been finding in our area that many of the DMEs have a waiting list now for POCs and we're kind of back to um, having e-tanks for patients or at least um, compressed gas. Next slide. So a pulse versus continuous flow, I just uh, went over that a little bit. On the next slide, we'll get into a few details. I don't wanna to get too technical, but just to understand when we say continuous flow, that's liters per minute, and that device is delivering oxygen throughout your breathing cycle. So its flow of oxygen continues, and it actually makes a little reservoir of oxygen in the back of your throat and upper airways. On pulse or demand flow, this is the setting where you'll hear a little uh, trigger, a little ticking when the breath comes in. 
Oxygen only flows through the cannula when you inhale, and that's what starts that trigger. So as soon as you inhale, the device senses it and gives you a pulse of oxygen. Next. And again, this next one is just a bit technical, but minute volume delivery is the most common way these devices work. And what that means is no matter how fast or slow you breathe, the device will give you a set amount of oxygen over that uh, minute. So if you breathe more rapidly, if you're breathing 20, 20 breaths per minute, each pulse will contain a little less oxygen. If you breathe slower, the, the amount of the milliliters per oxygen in that pulse will be a little higher. So the whole volume is the same in a minute, no matter, no matter how what your breathing rate is. So that's just the most common one. I won't even go to the next one. So next slide. So I just want to point out there's some great references, and I'll and I'll talk about this later. But uh, we did uh, in our I mentioned the Oxygen Special Interest Group, one of our uh, really uh, leading advocates here, Mary Kitlowski, who is uh, runs the Primary Ciliary Dyskinesia Foundation, developed a very wonderful, very detailed, informative handout um, to address this understanding of the differences between continuous and pulse flow. Next. And so the key points here, four liters a minute does not necessarily equal a number four on your POC. The majority of pulse flow POCs deliver one to two liters per minute total. And again, even between different POCs, a setting of two may vary in terms of how much oxygen it delivers. So there's a lot of variation between the POC devices. So it's very important you get tested on the device that you're going to purchase or rent or be supplied by your GME. And even after you get it, you might be fine and able to keep your saturations above 90% on their, on their settings. You need to keep monitoring that and alert your healthcare team if anything changes. And do um, I think it's important to run by your healthcare team what your plan is if you're purchasing this on your own um, so that we're aware and we can guide you. Next. And again, this has uh, been some marketing online of some very uh, inadequate POCs. It's kind of like a black market of POCs. And I mentioned uh, Mary before, we had a meeting that she organized with the FDA uh, just a few weeks ago and talked about how much misinformation is out around POCs and how there's some marketing of some very inadequate POCs. Next. So lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, I mean, it could be a long conversation, but the challenges of providing oxygen for patients who need higher flow rates and to keep them mobile and active. Uh, this was one of the slides from our supplemental oxygen survey. And you can see when we surveyed almost 2,000 patients, we asked them how many hours a day out of the house oxygen um, do you need, would you like, and how many actually do you have? And you can see here in the red, um, is how many hours out of portable supply they had. And you can see it was around uh, up to two hours, uh, some up to four. But when we asked how much would you like or do you need, you can see the most common was five or six hours. Next. So staying active, uh, if you need over four liters, three or four liters, and you can't keep saturations up with the POC, you really are likely going to have to transfer to compressed gas and really watch your saturations. Next. Changes in oxygen need a new prescription from your GM for us to, to supply to your DME so they can provide you differences in tanks and perhaps a high flow stationary concentrator. Next. Now, in the ideal world, we think it'd be nice for you to have a POC for those well, calmer activities where you just want to either get out of the house, maybe go have dinner with family or friends or at a restaurant, um, go to religious services, uh, and, and that might meet your needs. But for anything with exertion like pulmonary rehab or your exercise, you really are going to need an E-tank. But remember, um, I think that's my next point. Uh, Medicare only covers one mode of portability, so they will not cover both a POC and a canister of oxygen, which is really um, something we're working on. Again, we have a lot to work on here. Next, we want to keep you active. So you can just click through these and 
to make up all these points. Thank you. So these are the challenges, and we really want you to be creative. And you know, we all learn. The nurses in our clinic, myself, we learn from our patients who are incredibly um, innovative. And there's there is a lot of device research also going on. So take advantage of anything you can to um, get the amount of oxygen to get out of the house. Double E carriers, that is very cumbersome. Wheelchairs with holders, tank holders for your car. Um, again, try and conserve your oxygen when you sit so you can turn it down. And there is some research going on for remote control if patients really want, and we agree. Um, one option is getting a high flow concentrator at home. So this is a high flow stationary concentrator. And do your exercise at home. There's wonderful videos. There's home pulmonary rehab videos. So this would allow you to exert yourself at home um, using high flow. We much rather have you out of the house. And you can see the middle picture there. This is a Bev, who's a lamb patient with a different type of lung disease, but uses high flow playing tennis. So she has a combination of small tanks, big tanks, fancy made backpacks, really been innovative for that. We do have patients that swim. They lay down the E-tank at the side of the pool, have a long cord, playing tennis, biking, and, and golfing even. So it, it, it is not easy, but we really encourage you to give it a try. Next. This is one option. It's a different type of cannula. The pendant actually provides a little reservoir and can help actually in, increase the FiO2, the amount of inspired oxygen you're taking in. And it might make your help your tanks last longer. Next. And again, taking care of your nose, and I'll provide, you'll, you'll have these on your slide. We really want you to take care of your nose and avoid nosebleeds, especially with high flow. Next. And again, pulmonary rehab, very important. I won't go through all these points, but it's a critical strategy to help to address shortness of breath. And you, should, and you should be able to do it with adequate oxygen. Very important. Next. And other strategies. Oxygen alone won't do this to help shortness of breath. Exercise, fans, relaxation, yoga, um, medications as needed, first slip breathing, social support, and uh, continuing to travel somehow. Car, train, boat if you can't fly. Next. And having a safety plan is a great uh, resource I'll give you at the end. Next. And these resources will be included. And again, um, I won't go down the list, but the challenge is that these resources are out there. And we really want to connect you to them. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Gary, who can really take on um, letting us know all the hard work that we are all doing for you. So Gary, I will turn off my camera and. Thank you. And this is some other resources that will come out with these slides. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so I'm Gary Yort, staff of the American Thoracic Society, and I do government relations for the American Thoracic Society. Essentially, I'm one of the ATS lobbyists. So let's start where we got. Next slide, please. So competitive bidding, you're going to hear me mention this, and this is a new program that Congress required Medicare to adopt in 2003. It essentially says instead of buying durable medical equipment, oxygen, wheelchairs, diabetes, glucose monitors, crutches, name your thing, um, instead of buying them on a schedule, what they're going to do is require providers to, or DME companies to submit competitive bids, and whoever gets um, submits the lowest price bid gets to provide that service to all Medicare beneficiaries in that area. Um, next slide. So, um, had some interesting impacts. So, um, not all um, things were sub. Uh, you know, since we're short on time, I'm going to try to move fast forward. So, the next slide. So let's talk about what's the impact. So here's the impact it had. So Congress took a look at this uh, and CMS did some estimates and uh, their conclusion was competitive bidding program continues to maintain access and quality while helping save Medicare millions. Um, and this was a headline from a 2016 CMS press release. In the first year, they estimated it saved about $200 million uh, in Medicare expenditures. 
Um, and they expect it'll save about uh, $25 billion in Medicare expenditures between 2013 and 22, as well as $17 billion spending in Medicare beneficiary co-pays over the same period. So the important take home from this slide is when Medicare talks about competitive bidding, they see something that was a cost saving success. Next slide. But what did it look like from our perspective? Our perspective being patients, our perspective being providers. Well, for oxygen, it had a somewhat different impact. So what we're seeing here is a table from 2010 to 2020. 2010 was the year the competitive bidding first started for oxygen. And it shows you how many claims and how much money Medicare spent on stationary liquid systems from 2010 to 2020. And you'll see there's a precipitous drop from 2010 to 2030. There are about 32,000 Medicare beneficiaries in 2010 that were using a liquid stationary systems that dropped down to just under 6,000 in 2016. Next slide. Same data for the portable liquid systems. Again, about 40,000 Medicare beneficiaries in 2010 who had portable liquid oxygen systems and down to about 8,000 in 2016. Now, I'm, uh, I need to note that this slide and the previous slide are based on a Medicare 3% file, so that's essentially taking all Medicare claims, taking out 3%, using that 3% to estimate the rest of the 97%. Um, next slide. We thought, would it look different if we used the Medicare 100% file? And these are slightly different years, but it shows the same trend line. So from 2017 to 2021, using the Medicare 100% claim file, you see a same trend line in that in 2017 for portable liquid oxygen, there's about 95,000 claims dropping down to 24,000 claims in 2021. Same uh, uh, precipitous drop for stationary liquid. Next slide. What's important is competitive uh, bidding impacted all oxygen modalities, but liquid oxygen dropped most severely. Uh, we've seen significant drops from 2010 from 2020. Um, those who need continuous high flow, people with pulmonary fibrosis or other severe lung diseases, um, are particularly at risk because liquid oxygen is the most uh, adaptable for providing a high flow uh, for those who need uh, three liters per minute or more. What's also important to note is there were no changes in how we treat respiratory medicine. There were no changes in the disease portfolio of respiratory medicine that happened between 2010 and 2020 that would explain such a precipitous drop in liquid oxygen. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So what have we done about it? Uh, we've complained to CMS and Medicare made some modest changes to how they pay for it, but not enough to really change the market dynamics that would make um, oxygen payment for all systems, including liquid oxygen, more um, thoughtful. We've also gone to Congress and have um, uh, generated some letters from Congress to Medicare saying, this is a problem, you need to do something about this. So we have been developing some um, support among members of Congress about the problems that competitive bidding has caused in the um, oxygen market, most acutely in the liquid oxygen market. Next slide, please. And then COVID came along and made everything we saw in access to oxygen even worse. Um, well, I won't say anything good came out of uh, COVID. One of the um, interesting uh, unexpected effects is it made Policymakers pay a lot more attention to oxygen in general, and um, now we believe that we can take advantage of that attention uh, to our benefit. Next slide, please. So where are we? Um, competitive bidding. Impact um, liquid oxygen is basically not available in 90 plus percent of the U.S., so it's very rare for uh, Medicare beneficiaries to be able to access liquid oxygen, even those who have high flow needs. Uh, the payment rate is not high enough for DME companies that supply oxygen to want to supply it. Um, we now are about to have a generation of pulmonary uh, physicians who've essentially had their entire clinical career where liquid oxygen isn't available. So we're losing clinical expertise on how to use oxygen. 
And it's also the a situation is severe enough that not only is it the Medicare oxygen market that um, no longer is able to provide liquid oxygen, but the private insurance market is also seeing similar access problems. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a chart from um, the study that Susan Jacobs and her colleagues did. Um, and essentially, uh, patients aren't particularly happy with any aspect of the oxygen system. So while you hear me talk a lot about liquid oxygen, um, there's need for improvements in the entire oxygen market. Next slide, please. Clinicians aren't happy either. Next slide, please. So where's Medicare on this? We agree that individual problems with access to items and services may not be detected in the claims and health outcomes and monitorings, but we do not agree that widespread issues exist that are undetected. So Medicare doesn't think there's a problem. So we need to go to Congress. Next slide, please. Next. So we have brief CMS on this. We've discussed with Congress on this, and we are working on developing um, legislation to reform the entire oxygen, um, uh, Medicare uh, supplemental oxygen system. Next. The legislation has four parts. One, it would remove all oxygen from Medicare competitive bidding and establish a new payment system for um, for concentrated gas, concentrated uh, concentrator systems, and a add-on for high flow um, needs for liquid oxygen. It makes technical uh, corrections to the Medicare oxygen statute. It creates a new payment category for respiratory therapists to provide support for patients who receive uh, supplemental oxygen and creates a payment bill of rights. Next slide. Where are we now? If you Push return a couple more times. So uh, we have drafted legislation and we've been talking to key members of Congress. And I am pleased to say that uh, Senator Kennedy, a uh, Republican senator from Louisiana, has agreed to introduce oxygen reform legislation. We're still working to recruit members in the House of Representatives to introduce this legislation. Once the bill is introduced, uh, we're hoping to have the legislation including an end of session bill that typically ends, uh, happens at the end of Congress. So not 2023, but likely 2024 is when we're hoping to get this legislation enacted. And we'll need the help of all uh, patient provider groups, including the pulmonary, uh, um, uh, pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary fibrosis communities. Next slide. We can do this. Bishop Push. A similar coalition was very um, helpful in getting uh, Medicare benef Congress to pass legislation on pulmonary rehabilitation. We've also been successful in this community in opening up FAA's um, ability to allow supplemental oxygen on airplanes. So this is something that we have the capacity and the plan to do. I'm excited that we have legislation and um, look forward to working with you all to get that legislation moving forward. Next slide. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, I'm going to invite um, all of our panelists to come back. I know we are at the hour, but that was so much incredibly useful um, information. Really exciting update from Gary there about the oxygen legislation. And I wanted an opportunity to just take a couple of questions. So if you can stay with us for a few extra minutes, we'll do, we'll do that. Um, Dr. Joshua, I'm going to ask you first. Um, we had several questions about... Um, from patients who, when they do exercise, they do exert themselves, maybe their oxygen love, oxygen supply doesn't quite meet their needs, or they have to walk across the room to put their oxygen on, and in the meantime, their oxygen levels go down. And I, I think the question behind that is, how dangerous is a briefly low oxygen level, and um, and how long is too long, and and at what point do you know do we start to run into issues with um, issues in the tissue. Yeah, that's that's a great question because that's, I think, uh, what most of my patients deal with as well um, because you need a much lower supply when you are at rest, but then as soon as you start walking and going to your oxygen concentrator to increase it, you're already deciding. So I think um, there is no guideline to say that this much is more dangerous, but I think it adds up. You know, those small, those brief 
low numbers uh, if you're doing that over and over again throughout the day i think it adds up and that can lead to the complications that we discussed especially the pulmonary hypertension so what i tell my patients is actually to maybe if they are you know just resting for a very long time yes reduce it but then if you are like on the go and you're like resting but getting up again resting getting up again maybe have that like in a little bit higher uh, number that you might need when you're exercising so you don't have to keep walking back and forth or keep your oxygen concentrator next to you when you're you know exercising so it's right there to increase it but i would prefer not to have those um, rapid drops and then catching up because some of the patients actually take longer to uh, go back up again. So I think um, I think it is it is uh, significant to not to avoid those drops. That's great. I and mean, that's a great answer. Um, Susan, I have a couple for you. Um, the first is um, hopefully an easy one, maybe. Um, but uh, question about the best system, and I guess this is part of this is the type of system for people who travel to higher elevations, and how do you know? Elevation is significant, and you should always let your care team know that you're going to plan to do that. Um, and if you're already on oxygen, you can assume that your needs are going to be higher when you go to elevation, um, because oxygen is less at that altitude. Um, and so you'll have to adapt for that and have the capability of your oxygen system to adapt. And that's challenging. So if you're flying by air, um, you'll need to keep your oxygen on. And if you, you know, we have patients that aren't sure if they need it at altitude or not. And there is a test you can do called the high altitude simulation test or HAST, where we can bring you into the lab and actually have you breathe in a lower percent of oxygen, around 17%, where normally it's 21%. And we can try and simulate a condition at altitude, which also we think of as flight because the airplanes are pressurized to around six to 8,000 feet, varying some. So you can have a test done to predict how much you might need and if you need to take oxygen on the plane with you. And then once you get to your destination, I highly advise having oxygen delivered to that destination, working you know a month in advance with your DME and say, I need a stationary concentrator delivered to you know, Denver, Colorado, or Lake Tahoe, or wherever, um, and have plenty of portable high flow tanks. So you really need to plan ahead um, at altitude. Absolutely, and for any travel, I think it's just not not impossible. It's more of a logistical, um, you just adds a level of logistical complexity yeah. to it. Um, second question for Susan, um, how, so I had some questions. Uh, we've had several listeners ask about the ability to exercise when they need high flow oxygen and it runs out too quickly with a smaller tank, but they're on the go, they wanna be out hiking or moving and um, and they just, the bigger tanks are too cumbersome or not mobile enough um, for them. What, what advice do you give? I know there's some innovators in your clinic, but is there anything that you typically give for advice for those folks? I'm all to call Gary. <laughs> and then Senator Cassidy next. Uh, I mean, this is a challenge. I, I really, I don't want to diminish the the significance of that question, but it is our everyday challenge. So, you know, you can only have so many e tanks floating around in your trunk. That's the first safety concern, right? When you go out, uh, there are actually racks made to to put in your trunk or, or in your car, um, so that they're not rolling around, but you know, getting out, aside from having liquid oxygen as an option, if you're high flow, you're taking e-tanks with you, which I hate to say because it's the opposite of what we should be telling a patient. We're trying to make you mobile, but we're going to give you an 18-pound apparatus to cart around. Um, so again, if you can take your portable, you know, if you have a POC and you have e-tanks, you just have to really be innovative. I, I don't have a great answer, and, and Dr. Josh, I don't know if you have any answer, but right now, for high flow and being out of the house, it's multiple e-tanks um, or smaller tanks, but multiple, and you have to work very closely with your DME. And sometimes we find DMEs will be wonderfully supportive and try and you know deliver 12 smaller tanks so that you can put it in a backpack and do that hike at a higher flow and just keep switching them. Um, and other DMEs can't be as accommodating. Um, that's what I we're working I, on. 
I want to reiterate, I think, a point that she made during her presentation that you don't have to depend, though, on your exercise to be, you know, you don't have to go out to just do that. You could maybe do your majority of the exercise at home using your home high flow stationary concentrator that goes up to 10 liters. Get your exercise for the day and then maybe, you know, do a little bit less exercise at home if you are limited, if you if you're exhausting the e-tank option. A good point. I have a last question for Gary, um, since we are running up against our time. And this is a this is a physician question, but I think it's um, it's one I think other folks would like to hear as well. Um, I know that uh, the Oxygen Working Group has looked for um, patient experiences of um, prescribing liquid oxygen and not being able to get it, and documentation of that. And I have run into several times because there is. There's really very limited oxygen infrastructure where I am as well. Um, uh, DME companies that when we request liquid oxygen, they'll say, we only provide that for existing prescriptions and we aren't doing any new prescriptions, probably because they don't have a, a cost and, and infrastructure and all of that. They will not put it in writing in any way, shape or form. And I'm wondering how do we document those things when we're not, um, you know, we're we're having trouble getting any actual feedback. They'll make a phone call, but they won't they won't put anything in writing and let us document it in any other way. So I don't know that I have an answer to that, but I believe even writing that down that hey, I contacted my DME company. I have a prescription for oxygen. My uh, provider has uh, prescribed liquid oxygen for me, and my DME company is telling me verbally that they will not provide liquid oxygen and have instead provided this alternative system. You might not be able to document that conversation, but you can document that I have a high flow need and they gave me this system, not that system. Um, that's not probably the easiest um, documentation request for patients to, to meet, but it still tells the story that we have a problem in the oxygen market, specifically for liquid oxygen. I would welcome input from uh, Dr. Joshua and, and Susan Jacobs as well. No, I, I agree. It's very difficult to document this. We've done the same. And our issue was we were asking our, our physicians to write an order for liquid oxygen so that we could document any denials. And our, our physicians have never seen liquid oxygen. You know, they're a little, some of them are younger than me. So, so it, it's another whole issue. It's been so long since we've had it that we can't even, that the clinician doesn't even aware of it as an option and, and patients. So it's really complex. But I agree in trying to still document any of those interactions. And at the risk of editorializing here, quite frankly, I, I get a little frustrated with members of Congress and, con and CMS saying, can you document cases of it? Their own data shows they had 32,000 patients in 2010 on liquid oxygen, and we're now down to, what, 6,000 um, 10 years later. We shouldn't, the burden of proving that there's a problem uh, is really, we've met that burden pretty well. And it's up to them to start coming up with the solutions or start working with us on solutions rather than to keep coming back to us and say, can you prove there's a problem? Come on, guys. We prove there's a problem pretty convincingly. Well said. Completely agree. Um, well, thank you all so much. We are well over our time. And I really appreciate you all um, hanging, out, hanging on with us here to the end. Um, thank you, Dr. Joshua. Susan, Gary, for your expertise, excuse me, I'm an itchy nose today, and, um, and for all of this incredibly valuable information, uh, thank you all for your attention. Um, just a reminder, if you um, want to go to the handouts tab on your control panel, you'll have a few more seconds to download these slides. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors uh, for our disease education webinar series um, that support us all year long. Thank you so much again to our partners that we showed at the beginning of our webinar. And if you have a moment, um, please uh, please stay. You'll get um, a request for feedback, a little survey about our webinar today, and you can give our feedback and hopefully shape our future webinars. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you again uh, for our next uh, installment of our disease education webinar series, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.